Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, once again to the house of the Lord on this beautiful, much cooler Sabbath morning. Have you noticed how much easier it is on days like this to say, this is the day the Lord has made than those 109 degree days? A little later in our service, our pastor is going to be preaching an important message to us about how we should live in troubled times, difficult times, the times that we find ourselves in. And I hope you'll listen and pay careful attention to hear the word of the Lord today. As we begin this morning, I want to share with you some selected passages from the book of Ephesians about how we are to live as God's people every day. For in these days, if there, if there was ever a time when God's people need to live a life that shines forth the love and light of Christ, it's now. And we need to know how to do that by his grace and strength. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Be very careful how you live not as unwise, but as wise, making the very most of every opportunity because these are evil days. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is and be filled with the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Every morning, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For you see, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Will you pray with me? Father, there's so much in these words of Scripture that speak to us and probably bring some condemnation and conviction to us. So many things, but that's the way we ought to live you want us to live and the world is watching us see if serving Christ really makes a difference and I wonder sometimes if those around us even know that we are followers of Christ oh God may our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and we may bring glory to you our father in heaven is our prayer we might need a tune-up today, many of us, on how we should live. May we not brush the truth aside, but may we hear the word of the Lord today, these words, and the words our pastor will share with us. And may we pray and apply them to our lives. And this week, push back darkness and make a difference for you in our little corner of the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Will you please stand with the choir and sing, I will sing of my Redeemer.
Our reading this morning will be from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, and at his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy, and I will sing and make music to the Lord. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Our choir blesses us week by week, and we're so very thankful for them and the joys they bring to our lives. We welcome our visitors today. We are so glad that you have come to share with us. 
visitors are always important because it's an opportunity to meet new people and we have the opportunity to sh let to let you know something about this church and what we're doing and how God is blessing us and using us. If you're a first time visitor, will you just fill out the information? We'd like to send you some information about our church to let you know who we are and what we're doing. So we enc encourage our visitors always to come. Make sure you say, <coughs> excuse me, stay for our fellowship where we get a chance to greet you and to get to know a little bit more about you. You can all you also use the back of that yellow slip for all sorts of information that you may want to give to the office and they will take care of it uh, Monday morning. So that's a very helpful little piece of paper. We're delighted to have our flowers today. They are given by Merle and Charlotte Cooper and on the meaning of their 60th wedding anniversary took place August 15th. <laughs> Merle, stand up. Where's Charlotte? Okay. Flowers are important to our worship service <clears throat> and they add immeasurably to our seeing and to our believing. Several things coming up that you want to remember about. Uh, next Sunday, our pastor will be leading a class on believers' baptism. He'll be talking about what the scripture says, how it applies, what it means, and an opportunity simply to come and to hear It'll be about an hour study about believers' baptism and what it says. And then we're going to end that day next Sunday with a baptismal service and at Maryland Hills House at 5 o'clock. If you've never seen a baptism outside, it is a radically different experience than seeing it in a baptistry in a church. So I encourage you to mark that on calendar and to be a part of it. There'll be quite a few that are going to be baptized upon next Sunday, and you'll want to be a part to share in that experience. Then the next Sunday night, September 1, is our movie night. If you've not filled out that little piece of paper, we encourage you to do it, to tell them what kind of sandwich you would like. The movie that we're going to see that night is Cry of the Beloved Country. Many of us have tried to remember whether we saw it way back there. It's the story of what takes place in South Africa. It is a joyous story. Many of us have read the book, God Moves in Mysterious Ways, and this tells about two families and how they react to what God is doing in their midst. So I encourage you on September 1st, 5 o'clock will be our dinner, our sandwiches, and our dinner time then the movie to follow that. So you can mark that on your calendar. And then the next Sunday, September the 8th, our pastor will be leading another class about who this church is, what this church believes, how we go about doing, how we feel God is leading us based on biblical principles. So I encourage you once again, if you would like to be a part of that class, to sign up for it. That will be on September the 8th. It'll be right after the worship service. We provide the lunch for you as our pastor shares something about who we are and what God is doing in our midst. And for those of you who have delayed signing up to go to the ball game Wednesday, this is your last opportunity. They'll be out there to sign you up. They'll be going to see the ball game uh, leaving here at 530 and, and have that experience. So if you've not done that and you want to go, there's still tickets available for that. We're glad that you're here. May God bless you as we worship and share this time together. As we come to our time of prayer today, I want to just mention to you, a lot of you ask us, uh, how are we doing with our search committee as we look for someone to come and uh, share in the ministry here as an associate, and uh, we are still in the process of meeting with a number of people. Um, you just pray for us that uh, God is leading us in this, and uh, in the meantime, God's blessing the ministry we're having here. We're having a blast doing what we're doing, but we really look forward to finding somebody who can come and enjoy just ministry with all of you in the same way. Well, this morning as we pray, I would like to ask you to pray for a few people. Let's continue to keep... Uh, I'm going to make sure... How's this working here today? There we go. Martha Bulin. Martha's still having a tough time. She's over there in uh, Lincoln Meadows, just very, very weak. And we just, uh, doctors, uh, they're not quite sure what's going on there. So let's just continue to lift her up in prayer as well as her husband, Wayne. Kathy Beecham, a lot of you know Kathy, she sits right over there. 
uh, she had a pretty serious back surgery. In fact, it had to be two days in a row. And uh, they put a rod in her back. She's recovering. She's in uh, physical therapy at this point. So really lift her up in prayer. And uh, we just, uh, they're special people and uh, really be praying for them. And then also Thelma Larson. Don't have a picture for Thelma, but Thelma is home now. She had some serious heart surgery here the last few weeks. And uh, just keep praying for her and uh, soon she'll be back with us. And then also pray for the Libertis who were here. We, Diane and I had a special treat on Saturday morning, had them over to our house for breakfast and got a chance to spend some time together. I think one of the things you really want to lift them up in prayer is not only are they dropping off Bianca at college in uh, Indiana in another week or so, and I, we well remember when we dropped off our youngest to a college back there and then had to leave. That was a, that's an emotional experience. And Sophia has to get back now, so she's flying on ahead, uh, lands in Zurich, Switzerland, and then people there who are in Germany will pick her up. She starts school in another week. So just lift up that prayer, that family in prayer. I, I got to tell you, we are so blessed to be, have them as part of our missionary corps. They are just a choice couple, Steve and Don. So would you join me now this morning as we pray together? Father, thank you for this morning. And as we come as a family of God to pray, we know that you call us to pray without ceasing and rejoice always and always giving thanks and everything. And Lord, as we do that, we, there are times for all of us to come together as a family to do that. And today we, we lift up so many that are ailing and not well, but especially, Father, today we pray for Martha. And God, just somehow begin to give her the strength back so, so that she can be back home with her husband, Wayne. And Lord, I pray for uh, Kathy Beecham that um, just what they did and putting that rod in her back will really be effective and helpful. And soon she'll be out of the therapy and back home. And I pray for her husband, Glenn, Lord, because uh, they need a caretaker with him while she's gone, and I just pray, Father, that all will be well there and soon that Glenn and Kathy can be back here. And for Thelma, Lord, thank you that she's come through this heart surgery and that she's home. But, Lord, lift her up and let, let her begin to have her strength back and be back with us soon. And, Lord, for the Libertis, how we thank you for them. And, God... I pray for them this week as they send Sophia back home to Germany and in another week dropping off Bianca, Bianca at a college. And Father, I just pray that you give them all the emotional support they're, need, they're going to need in that time. And then in October, Father, they'll be doing an evangelistic crusade in Albania. And I pray even now you're preparing them for that. God, it's so good to be here. Thank you for how you have blessed us and watched after us. Father, continue to cause our eyes to be lifted up to the hills from whence cometh our help. And may we never doubt for a moment that our help cometh from the Lord that maketh heaven and earth. God bless us now as we continue in this service today. We give our gifts to you now. And may it lift up the name of Jesus somewhere for someone today. In Jesus' name, amen. I lost my sins and I found my Savior, there is glory in my soul. Since by faith I sought and obtained God's favor, there is glory in my soul. There is glory, 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 there is glory in my soul. Every day brighter grows and I conquer all my foes. There is glory. Conquer all my foes. There is no 
Thank you, guys. I wish I could sing like that. I wish I had the pep that David has up there. <laughs> Great. Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, over the years, something I've always gotten a charge out of, a funny church sign. Have you seen? I'm sure you've all seen some, and there are whole books on this stuff. But uh, I had to put a few up for you today. We don't have a place to put church signs out there, but uh, I like this one. God wants full custody of his children, not just weekend visits, okay? All right? You need a lifeguard? Ours walks on water. <laughs> That's good. Use sunscreen to prevent sin burn. Oh, wow. Heaven is not a trick, and hell is not a treat. <laughs> that must be for Halloween. I love this one. Adam and Eve, the first people to not read the Apple terms and conditions. <laughs> oh, my. Keep using my name in vain, and I'll make rush hour longer, God. <laughs> Here's one. Facebook, God has sent you a request. <laughs> it's actually a show on TV. God friended me. OK. Text message, we need to talk, God. <laughs> and then I love this one. God answers all knee mail. There we go. Uh, tweet others as you would like to be tweeted. <laughs> well, I don't tweet anybody, so that's all right. Forgive your enemies, it messes with their heads. <laughs> and I hate this church, Satan. <laughs> but this is the one I love the best. Now is a good time to visit our pastors on vacation. <laughs> I'm not sure what that church was saying, but <laughs> that's great. I love it. All right. Well, those are all humorous, but I came across another church sign, and so I, I just put the content up there. Yeah, this is interesting. Schedule of meetings this week, all at 7 o'clock at night. Monday night, Alcoholics Anonymous. Tuesday night, say no to drugs. Wednesday, eating disorders. Thursday, avoiding mass shootings. Friday, teen suicide watch. Saturday, abused spouses. And then at the bottom, they have Sunday sermon. America's joyous future. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about that one. But truthfully, if you're like me, and like most of us, as we watch the news and we see things that happen in the news, it alarms us. And it makes us awfully uneasy uneasy about the world we live in. I mean, you, you see things like mass shootings like this, um, and you realize that stuff is going on all over the world, and you say, you say to yourself, is it coming apart? Lord, are you coming soon? And one wonders. But you know, it isn't just about the coming of Jesus either. It's, you know, any one of us can go to the doctor one day for our regular physical, and he says, oh, what about that lump? Or what about, hmm, I hear something. That doesn't sound so good. And they do a few tests, and then the next thing you know, he says something to you to the effect. You know, we've got to do some treatment, and I'm not sure, but you have about six months or something like that. Somebody asked me one time, what's it like pastoring a church like this, all seniors? I said, it's really been great. I said, the best part about it is I don't have to work with youth pastors anymore. But the really tough thing is the fact that relationships tend to be shorter. And good friends suddenly, God calls them home. And we all know that. We, we know what that's like. And you know, so when we wonder if, if the world is coming to an end, or, 
or am I, how much of a joy future do I have? You know, it isn't just about the world. It isn't just about America. It's about each one of us every day. One thing I've learned being here, every day is a gift of God. Amen? Amen. And it's the grace of God every day. So rejoice in the Lord every day as long as you have time to rejoice. But the simple fact is that we, we do live as if Jesus were coming at any moment, whether or not it'll be at the rapture when he comes in the tribulation, or more likely when he comes and calls us home. The people in Peter's day wondered about that. First Peter chapter 4, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn there this morning. In First Peter chapter 4, the times in which he was writing this were troublesome times. The Neronian persecutions were breaking out in Rome. If you know a little bit of that history, you know that there was a massive fire in Rome. It probably burned a third to a half of the city down. Most of the people thought Nero was responsible. He may well have been. He wanted to have this big building project. And the only way he was going to get it was to have half of the city burned down. And so public opinion was that he started it. Well, to deflect public opinion, there's this new sect called Christians. And he diverted the attention onto them and blamed them. And for about three years in Rome, a horrible, intense persecution broke out. You've probably seen the pictures of them being thrown in the arena, burned at stakes, crucified. All of this was breaking out in Rome, and Christians were worried. It would ultimately take the life of Peter and Paul. They would be martyred in Rome. But Peter wrote a letter. It's called that first epistle to Peter. He talks about the fiery trials that are breaking out among you, and he, he seeks to encourage the believers. But there's a little short passage from verses 7 to 11 that I find incredibly important. Because there he really describes what's to be the response to troublesome times, whether or not it's a persecution or whether or not it's bad news from the doctor, whatever it may be. What's to be our response when those times come? He says, the end of all things is near, and that can have many, many meanings. It can be the end of the world. It can be the end of your business. It could be the end of your life. But what do you do? Well, he begins by saying there are four responses, and here's the first one. What he says is, therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Why? So that you can pray. And that takes us to this first response. Pay increasing attention to prayer. Hello. I mean, that's not news to us. And yet, I think all of us, as we grow older in life, and we observe what happens, and everybody in this room has been some, through some kind of crises, whether it's a financial thing, a family crisis, or a health crisis. We, we, most of us sitting here have been through that period called the Vietnam War and whatever else you've been through. Many of you were were growing up in the Depression, and, and, and many of you went off and, and fought in World War II and Korea. Uh, you, you, we all know what an upheaval that brings to our lives. And when we reflect on those things, I would hope anyway, it makes all of us a little more needful or sensitive to the need of prayer in our lives. Prayer isn't just something that the pastor does on Sunday morning. It isn't just something that I do before my meal. Prayer is really an attitude. It's practicing the presence of God. It's listening to his voice. I like the way it says here. The end of all things is near. Therefore, he says two things. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. Well, those two phrases there, clear-minded, self-controlled, really are two words. And they describe, one, on the one hand, the outward response to crises and the inward response. The first one, the clear-mindedness, is about the person that, that just manages to keep their cool. That's the way Warren Wiersbe likes to translate it. Keep your cool. It's that outward reaction. Not to get all flustered, all excited. And, and sometimes, you know, some of us, I, you know, I say some of us, I've been there. We get into prophecy sometimes, and we get so excited, and we start figuring out who the Antichrist is. And we start trying to say, well, the, the, these nations right here, they're, they're the ten nations. Well, who knows? You can remember, I remember Hal Lindsey when he came out, late great planet Earth. Boy, that grabbed my attention like no other book did. 
And yet, lots of the things that Hal Lindsey talked about there, and the broad principles, he was right. But when you start identifying certain things, that's where you get into trouble. People have been doing that for years. And, and so, for outwardly, I need to be conscious that every day is a gift of God. I don't know whether Jesus is coming tonight. I don't know when he's going to come. You know, my greatest fear is the Lord isn't going to come for 200 years. <laughs> if you think it's bad now, imagine what's going to happen. Uh, Lord, I'd just as soon have you come pretty soon. But that's up to him. What about my own health? i got to tell you, every day I'm so grateful to God that I'm able to be here. And I, you know what my prayer is? Lord, just keep giving me health. I'm having a good time. Keep me healthy. Let me stay alive so I can keep serving you. That's why we're here. And that's a clear-minded assessment of what life is really about. That's the out response. But the self-control is more the inner response. Let me, let me give you a couple of great examples of this. One of those examples, and I like the way that the, the Living Bible puts it, be earnest and thoughtful men and women of prayer. Remember when Paul and, and Silas were in Philippi? And Acts chapter 16 records it for us. And there in Acts 16, it tells us about that time when they were there in prison. And here's what it says. They, you know, they, just because they were believers and the pagans in town, they saw that, that Paul and Silas, they start preaching this new way. And, it, and <laughs> bottom line was economic because they were, they were undermining the idol worship. And these guys were making lots of money off little silver idols they were selling. And so they, they started slandering them and they got thrown in prison. And while they're in prison, in stocks and everything, it says, long about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer, singing a robust hymn to God. They weren't saying, well, how did this happen? No, we tried to obey you, Lord. Oh, and we preached the word, and what happens to us? We get thrown in prison. This is not fair. But they sing, and they praise God. And the other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. And you know the story. There's an earthquake, and they all... They all get loose, except for Paul and Silas. They just stay put. And the, the, the prison guard comes in. And, and one of the things about, you know, if you were the prison guard, or particularly you were the warden in those days, if you lost your prisoners, then you lost your life. And so he's going to take his life. And, he, and they said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't do that. We're here. We're here. And the upshot of it is they go home with him, preach the gospel to him, and his whole family gets saved and baptized. But there's the outward expression. But Paul also describes his inward expression. And if you have your Bible, I'm going to read to you this morning from Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 and 25. Listen to this. This is a little later on. Now he's in Rome. He's under arrest. He's waiting to appear before Nero. And this is what he writes to the Philippian church. I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ may be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, and here's the inner, for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I'll get to serve you, Jesus. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Do you hear that? He knows on the inside. Oh, if the Lord chooses to take me home, if Nero goes, mm, then I'm going to be with Jesus. But frankly, and I'd love to be with him, but on the other hand, I love you, and I want to keep ministering to you. So to be alive, that's my prayer too. I can still have fruit so that your joy can be complete. And there's the inside. So, you know, what's to be our response? It, it's to be sober-minded and assess the world we live in. Yeah, it's a sinful world. Nothing's really changed. Jeremiah said, if the heart of man is desperately wicked, who can know it? We have seasons where it's better than others, but we have seasons where it seems like every disease of sin breaks out. Nothing's changed. But Jesus is still in command. I'll tell you one thing, folks. 
God is never in heaven wringing his hands. Oh, nuts. How did that happen? No. God sees you and he sees me. And he sees my child right there and I'm going to take care of him. This is, people ask me sometimes, you know, why didn't God, after Adam and Eve and the sin broke out and the devil, you know, did what he did, why did he just nail them all right then? You know why? Because you and I would never have been born. And God had his eye on you before you ever came into this world. He had a purpose for you. And, and it's like, like a disease. You know, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you got cancer. Well, fine, go in there and just rip it out, cut it out. It doesn't work that way. There's a process. And so it's going to take time. And yeah, there's going to be some surgery, but there's going to be some radiation. There's going to be some chemo because we want to eradicate it. That's what God does with this world. Yeah, he could have just, <laughs> right there, nailed Satan, nailed Adam and Eve, <laughs> done with it. Let's move on. I got the angels anyway. No. Because God and the mind of God knew you and I were coming into this world. And he loved you so much that already there in the Garden of Eden, he was sending his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross for you and for me. So that you and I might have a sin, diseaseless existence with him. Have my sins paid for. It had to work out that way. So when I pray, it's like Jesus in the Garden. He said, my father, if it's possible, remove this, this cup from me but not my will, but thine be done. And so when I, I look at life and I, I look at what goes on around me and whether or not it's a personal health issue, whatever it is, God says, be sober. Let it drive you to prayer all the more. And trust me, I'll take care of you. Well, the second response comes in the eighth verse. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I like the way the Message Bible puts it. Most of all, love each other as if your life depended on it. I would say, love each other as if the, the life of those around you depend upon it. Love will make up for practically anything. And here's the response. Work harder at loving people. Now, we say we love people, but I'll tell you, to truly love someone, it's a lot of hard work especially when they seem to be working against you. But that's what Christians do. Oh, oh, I'll come back to this one in a minute. That's the third one. I think one of the places we, we really see this, and, and I want you to notice that, that he says, above all else. That, that heightens the importance of this. Above all else. Let me take it back here for a minute. I want to go back and see. Love each other deeply. I think some of the translations say fervently. That word deeply or fervently is a, is a Greek word that is used about extending every bit of energy to do this. It was used by uh, the Greek writer Xenophon uh, to describe a horse at full gallop. And it was also used to describe an athlete in the games who was striving towards that tape with every bit of energy to break the tape before anybody else and be a winner. That's the word that's used when he said, love each other deeply. It doesn't say love each other casually. Don't, don't love each other when it's convenient. But no, go for the tape. Strain every bit of your fiber of being. That's how important this one is. Well, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, and he's trying to tell them what's going to happen. And we, we come around the communion table and we commemorate that moment. This is, this is my body, which is given for you. And this is, this is the cup and my blood. And, and they weren't really getting it. But then he says to them a little bit later, after he's washed their feet, he says, one more commandment I'm going to give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. First John, many years later, he'll repeat that several times in his first epistle. Love is a defining quality of Christianity. 
Francis Schaeffer, the theologian, he's now with the Lord, said many years ago, he said, love is the greatest proof of Christianity. And if we do not love one another, we have no right to expect anybody ever to believe our message. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about what love is. It's all about kindness. It's all about selflessness. It's all about never keeping track of the wrongs done to you. Somebody said that love is the odor that flowers give off when you step on them. I like that. He says, in light of the world you're living in, in light of every day of your life, which is not forever, work hard at loving people. Because that's how they're going to know that Jesus is real. Believe it or not, people, you and I will be the best evidence that Christ and the, the gospel are true. I like C.S. Lewis once put it, he said, the best, best proof of Christianity is Christians. But he said, unfortunately, the worst proof of Christianity is also Christians. <laughs> Think about that. Every day of your life, and I'm riding down the road, and somebody cuts me off. Yeah, I'm like everybody else. I don't honk. In Southern California, they shoot you if you honk. <laughs> Diane kneels me and says, honk at him. She's a little more prone to honking. I said, don't do that. I want to keep you around. You, know, you don't shoot them up here, I guess. But, but I'm like everybody else, and my, my temptation when somebody has wronged me is not to be too Christian. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit kind of yanks on me. He said, now, wait a minute. That's not what the master would do. My reaction is he never had to drive a car on the freeway. <laughs> it's how we behave. And whether I love and forgive and show kindness, even when it's not being shown to me, is the greatest evidence that the gospel that God has given to us is real. It's true. So what else? There's another response. And he gives it in a nice verse. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. What's hospitality mean? Hospitality is a, means entertaining strangers. The response is this. Give more and take less. You know, when Diane and I moved here, one of the things we prayed about is that God would give us a place that we could have people in and that we could, could share a home with people um, just in the way of having a meal or just enjoying each other's company. Folks, everybody, i got to tell you something. Everybody that lives in Lincoln Hills, I, I, there are days when I, I feel guilty. All right, Lord, what's the catch? We have been blessed beyond measure. We can't even begin to assess how blessed we are. I, even, you know, living anywhere around here, whether it's uh, Bosket Ranch or, or over in Roseville, wherever it might be. I mean, what you and I, all of us have is beyond what the rest of the world even begins to imagine having. Lord, what do you want me to do with it? Well, right now you want me to fix this window that's in the back of the house. That's, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> i got to tell you, last week when I was here in church, I feel so much better this week. <laughs> but you know what, Lord? You gave us that house, and we want to use it to touch lives for Jesus Christ. And i got to tell you, one of the greatest ways to do that is to sit down around a meal. You don't have to. Okay, I'm preaching here. I found out one thing in Lincoln Hills. Nobody likes to cook. No, I don't say nobody. <laughs> My wife likes to cook, you can tell. <laughs> but most people I talk to around, nobody wants to cook. Well, then send out for KFC or something like that. You know, just, just invite a neighbor in. Just have some coffee. Just have some refreshments. Just tell your neighbor, hey, I'm just so glad you're my neighbor. Don't bring them over and fatten them up and then hit them with the four spiritual laws. That doesn't work very well. No, build a relationship. And especially believers need that. And Paul, Peter understood that in times that he was preaching in and writing this letter, Christianity was definitely on the outs. 
and they needed each other. Later on, the book of Hebrews, we're also living in desperate times. And he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together in chapter 10. He says, but keep meeting together, encouraging one another, stimulating one another to love and good deeds. We need each other. And in the midst of crisis, we need each other more than ever. Learn to give more and take less. Use what God has given you. Keep on loving each other in Hebrews 13, it says. Love each other as brothers, and don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, it's always easy to entertain an angel, but a devil that lives next door is not so easy, is it? But love them anyway. Love them anyway. Matthew 25, let me read that to you. We, we've read it to you at other times, but here's what Jesus said in Matthew 25, particularly when in the context where he's looking at you know, the end of the age, and this is what he says. Matthew 25, beginning in the 35th verse. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then people are going to say, Lord, when do we do all that for you? And he said, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. You did it for me. Practice hospitality. Give more, take less. Use what you have, whatever it may be. And then the fourth response comes in the 10th and 11th verse. He says, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Use what you're good at to serve others. We're talking about spiritual gifts there. And most people, they sit there and say, well, you know, I'm, I can't speak. I can't teach. I, well, all right. That, okay, if you're not any good at that, you're good at something else, I guarantee you. Find out what you're good at and find a way to serve Jesus with it. Let me tell you about a man that I read about. Maybe you've seen it too. And, and before I get to it, I, I want to just deal with the translation here just a little bit. Of course, it emphasizes serving others. But down it says grace in its, and, and literally it's multicolored forms. Or somebody translated this way. Each one of you should use whatever gift he's received to serve others, faithfully bringing into focus God's kaleidoscope of grace. You know, that little thing you used to go, you know, twist that thing around when we were kids, the kaleidoscope. But you know, that's, we're that way. All of us are just a different color in the kaleidoscope of God's grace. And, you know, each of us helps focus that grace, God's wonder, his kindness, his mercy, brings it into focus, people, by using what he gave me to, to serve other people. Here's a guy I read about last week. Well, you know, I'm still not there yet. I'll show you in a minute. But he goes on to say this. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Okay, if, you, if you're good at speaking, let, let most of your speaking be about God's good news, what the word says. But if anyone serves, and that's probably a whole lot of other people, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Boy, I tell you, in a church like this, we are so blessed with people who know how to serve and, and just do things. You know, we always need teachers and preachers, yes, but you know, it's all the others of you who do so many little things here that make this place work. It's wonderful. But it doesn't have to just be in the church. Maybe you heard about this man. Somebody said once, find a hurt and heal it. That's the key. This guy right here. You know who this guy is? This guy, um, God, I've forgotten his name already. <laughs> but anyway, he's a guy that goes around the whole country whenever these crises happen, like the shooting down in uh, El Paso and then the shooting in Dayton. This guy brings crosses and puts the names of the people and puts them there. They're called Crosses for Losses. And he's been doing this ever since Columbine. He was so moved at the tragedy of Columbine, 13 young people killed, that he began making these crosses and bringing them at his own expense. So far, he's made over 23,000 crosses. Some of them are crosses. Most of them are probably crosses. But some of them 
are stars of David. And there are even some that are crescent moons. It's his way of saying, God loves you. And I, I want to share his love with you. He goes all over the country doing this. He's just a carpenter. He's 68 years old. But that's what he does. And he puts them out. He took a number of them, some of you may be aware, up to paradise when they had the fires up there. All people that lost homes. And he made crosses and took them up there. And you think, well, you know, okay. It's a big deal. But you know what? You try making 23,000 crosses all at your own expense. And then get in your car and travel anywhere just as a gift from God to say, God loves you. And I hope I can encourage you. That's using the abilities, the gifts, the, the, the experiences in his life to touch a life for Jesus Christ. One of the things that I keep saying to all of us here is that we all have a certain amount of time left until Jesus calls us home. We just don't know how long. But when I get in front of the Lord and you get in front of the Lord, what are you going to tell him? What are you going to show him? He's going to say, I gave you this. I gave you this ability. I gave you that home. I, I gave you a lot of different things. How would you use it for me? And for the rest of the way, folks, for the rest of the way, until we get to be with Jesus, let's make it our determined goal to use what God has given, to look at what he's given me. And Jesus, how can I serve you? How can I use it? You've given me hands that can serve. You've given me eyes that can see. Or you've given me legs that can walk. Or whatever it may be. How can I serve the kingdom of God? How can I bring the grace of and the love, and the kindness, and the mercy, and forgiveness of God to someone, someplace. Well, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. It's the way Peter line, lines it all up. Long time ago, when I was in college, I used to have to fly from San Diego all the way, and get all the way back to New London, Connecticut, where the Coast Guard Academy was. So I'd fly from San Diego up to Los Angeles, and then I'd catch a... a you know, nonstop, all the way to New York City, to Kennedy Airport. Now, the flight from, from L.A. To, to New York is about four and a half hours when you're going with the jet stream, so it's pretty fast. Um, when, you, when you get to uh, New York, then the longest part of the trip starts. <laughs> i got to get a cab and pay for that to get to Grand Central Station. And then I get to get on the New Haven Railroad. That was an, Amtrak owns it now, but it was an old railroad and been around a long time, and uh, I can still hear the conductor coming up and down the aisles, you know, yelling out the names of the place, Old Saybrook, which anyway. But there was a sign one day along the road that said, Jesus is coming soon. A few weeks later, somebody put another sign underneath, and it said, not if he takes the New Haven Railroad. <laughs> <laughs> slow, it doesn't matter. He is coming. And, and Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, then believe also in me. Because in my Father's house there are many mansions, and I'm going to prepare a place just for you. And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you this. He said, so that where I am, you can be also. Whether it's 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, or 100 years, he's still preparing a place because he wants us where he's at. And with that in mind, I think of a sign that I would love to put out in front. We don't have a sign, but if we had one, I'd probably put it up there. It'd be like this. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you something. We can laugh at that. But your picture is on his heart, every single one of you. Even if today you have not come to that place where you've embraced him, he still has that picture on his heart. Because it says, God so loved the whole world, God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son. So if you believe it, and you'll embrace him, he'll embrace you. And you will be forgiven. And you will be with him forever.
that's the good news. Now all you and I have to do is go out, embrace it, and live it. Let's stand and pray. Father, thank you very, very much for this morning. Thank you for how my heart has been thrilled as I listen to the choir, as I listen to the men sing, as I listen to the gentlemen play the horns. How my heart is thrilled, Lord, to be in the presence of your family here. But Lord, the greatest fill, thrill is that you are in this place. Lord Jesus, the days are short, and the days, they do trouble us. But we turn our eyes upon Jesus, and we look full in his wonderful face. And when we do that, the things of the world, they grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So Jesus, help us to look under the hills from whence cometh our strength. Let us know our strength cometh from the Lord that maketh heaven and earth. He will not suffer our foot to be moved. He'll not slumber. And behold, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Oh, Lord, you are our shade upon our right hand. And the sun will not smite us by day nor the moon by night. You are our keeper. You will, you will keep us from all evil. You will preserve our soul. You will keep us and guard us our goings out and comings in, ah, even forevermore. So turn our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Would you sing that song with me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jim Zinder is going to come and close in prayer for us. Brother, come. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for this message we've had today. We look at a world that's very ugly and dark at times, and we, we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that we might show love and be assigned to others. And, Lord, we just bless each and every person here. We pray that they will uh, go forth and show that love and that we'll uh, gather again next week. In Jesus' name, amen.